Hi there, welcome back. In this class, we start discussing options that are not the European call or the European put. We are considering options that are of a different type. We will start considering, for example, barrier options, that is to say options in which there is some barrier, some threshold, some level that determines how the option behaves. So we will see that we can have options in which we will verify if the underlying asset reaches, touches, overcomes, or does not overcome a given threshold or a given level. And depending on the behavior of the underlying asset with respect to the threshold, the option, the option value will change. So we will start from a very basic setting, that is to say the setting of knock-in and knock-out options because these can be seen as special subtypes of the European uh, framework. Uh, naturally, we can think of more sophisticated and advanced options, like, for example, the Parisian case in which the threshold changes over time and all the other stuff, but we consider the very basic setting in which we set a threshold, the threshold is constant, does not change, and we make all our evaluations with respect to that threshold. Now, what is very important is that in order to deal with barrier options, we will use some of the properties of the burning motion, and in particular, we will use properties of the maximum of the burning motion. We will use the reflection principle of the burning motion. Now, as you know, I will give these things for granted. If you do not recall these basic results, please have a look at your lecture notes, at the appendix of my lecture notes, or at any book on the Brunner motion. To define a knockout and a knock-in option is simple. The idea is to start from a European call. Okay, so that is our starting point. But then we add extra conditions. So the idea is that we add a threshold level that we call capital L. In a knockout option, you can exercise the option at maturity, at time capital T, as a standard in a European call setting, only if the underlying asset, so the stock that is underlying our uh, option, has not overcome, has not overpassed the threshold L. So we want that our price process changes, over, obviously, over time, but it is always below our threshold. So as soon as the price goes up and touches the threshold or overcomes the threshold, then the option is worthless. This is the knockout option. In a knock-in option, conversely, what we have is that the option is worthy, so it can be exercised and it makes sense to exercise the option only if the underlying price process passes the threshold. So we want the underlying process to be above the threshold at least once during the period zero capital T. Given our price process as T, we call MT the maximum price to date, which is nothing more than the maximum price level ever reached until today. Okay? Now, uh, a knockout option is nothing more than an option whose exercise value is S capital T minus K plus, that would be the European uh, standard call setting, but then we only consider that in the event that the max to date at maturity, so M capital T, is strictly smaller than a threshold level L. Now, in order to make sense in all our evaluations, we will assume that S0, so the value of the price process at time 0, is below the threshold L, and that capital K is also below L. For what concerns a knock-in option, it's essentially the same framework, but now the indicator is the opposite. So, is the indicator of the event M capital T being above the level capital L. An interesting thing to notice is that the sum of the payoffs 
of a knockout and a knock-in option corresponds to the payoff of a standard European call given the behavior of the indicators. This means that we only have to price one of the two barrier options and the value of the other one can be just obtained as a difference with respect to the price of a European call. As I already told you, in order to price a knockout option, we will make use of the properties of the maximum of the running motion and the so-called reflection principle. The idea of the reflection principle is very simple. We have a burning motion, we have a standard burning motion, and at a certain point we fix a threshold. Now this threshold works like a mirror. If the burning motion is below the threshold, nothing happens, but as soon as the burning motion touches the threshold or overpasses the threshold, then we create a second burning motion, which is the mirroring process of the original one. So if our process goes up, the other one will go down. If it goes down, the other one will go up, and so on. So what we have is that this new mirroring process is itself a running motion. And this second process is extremely useful to study the behavior of the max to date of a Brownian motion. Given the reflection principle, we can easily compute the probability, the joint probability of the maximum of a Brownian motion and of the Brownian motion itself. And this probability is easily expressed in terms of the CDF of a standard normal. It is important to notice that we are expressing the joint probability of the maximum and the Brownian motion, that is a bivariate quantity, in terms of a univariate distribution thanks to the reflection principle. Let's now consider the event that at time small t, our Brownian motion Vt is smaller than a given quantity x. Now, this event can be expressed as the union of two disjoint events if we also consider the maximum of the Brownian motion. In one case, the event is Vt smaller than x, while mt, the maximum, is smaller than a level y. In the other case, bt is smaller than x, while mt is larger than or equal to y. This means that if we consider the probability of the event bt smaller than x, which is a probability we know exactly thanks to the properties of the Brownian motion, this prob probability needs to be equal to the sum of the probabilities of the two disjoint events we have considered. But notice that for one of these two events, we know the probability. It's exactly that capital phi of x minus 2y over square root of t that we have computed before, thanks to the reflection principle. This means that we can easily combine the information and we can express the joint distribution of bt and of x maximum to date in terms of the difference of two normal CDFs. Now, what we have just considered is the case of a standard Brownian motion. So the problem is what happens if we consider a Brownian motion with drift, which is typically our problem in the change of measure operation. So from the physical measure to the risk neutral measure. Now the question is easily answered once again using the Cameron Martin theorem. So we can always find a new measure that would be our risk neutral measure under which the, the Brownian motion with drift behaves like a standard Brownian motion, and for this standard Brownian motion, we know what happens when we consider the max to date. So the idea is that to take what we have just said and to embed this stuff into the setting that is appropriate for our pricing purposes. So the process WT is a Brownian motion with drift under the original measure that here is P0 and it behaves like a standard Brownian motion under the measure P uh, eta. What we have to do is to define the appropriate Radon-Nikodin derivative that once again is an exponential martingale. After that we can compute the expectation under the measure P eta of the event f of w, where f of w represents the payoff of our uh, European call, jointly with the indicator of the event m capital t being smaller than a level 
Why? Now, this expectation can be expressed in terms of the expectation under the measure P0 once we introduce the radon nicotine derivative within the argument, and then we can just perform all our computations. What we just have to notice is the following for what concerns a couple of elements within our integral. The steps are quite simple. It is just a matter of looking at the argument within the exponential function and to rearrange the terms, collecting them, and notice that at the end of the day we are playing with a square quantity that will represent the argument of our uh, standard normal density. The same type of computations are also needed for the second part and I leave them to you. Therefore, we can explicitly give the distribution for the Brownian motion with drift eta and its maximum to date, which is the quantity h eta y x that you see on your screen, and that resembles clearly what we have found before for the standard Brownian motion. Now, in order to model our knockout option, we consider our uh, underlying asset to fall a geometric Brownian motion. We know that all the usual things work, so we know that we can express the discounted price process and blah blah blah. Uh, then the only thing that it's a little bit different is that in order to be in the money, so in order to have an option that is profitable for us at maturity, we have to consider given the barrier capital L, the situation in which our running motion with drift W is between two particular uh, bounds, that is to say L1 and L2. It is a simple but useful exercise to derive the quantity L1 and L2, so try it. Once we have the distribution function capital H, the density function small h, and we have the quantities L1 and L2, we have all the ingredients to cook our recipe. And our recipe is nothing more than applying the Black and Scholes Merton theorem to the case of a knockout option. Now, if you do that, and I suggest you to do that as a further exercise, you will see that despite being cumbersome in the sense that you have to be careful about all the little quantities involved and especially in how to split the integrals at the end of the day is nothing more than a little bit more uh, cumbersome and boring framework with respect to what we have already seen and said. So from, let's say, a purely theoretical point of view, there is no big difference. Now, while it is extremely useful to recall the formulas of a European call, of a European put, of the American case, it is, at least for me, not particularly interesting that you memorize the pricing formula of a knockout option. So this is not uh, the purpose of this course. My goal is that you remember the procedures that can be used in order to price an option. The formula itself is something that you can always find in a textbook if you, if you need it. Also for much more complicated situations. Now, uh, barrier options are an example of exotic options. We will also consider other examples, but this is a first example of those options that go under the name of exotic, that is to say that are not the vanilla cases like the European colon put and the American colon put.